Welcome to the conversation. I'm Paul Grandal, director of the New York State Writers Institute at the University of Albany. I'm very excited about today's guest, a friend and colleague, Dr. Jeffrey Berman, distinguished teaching professor in the English department at UAlbany, where he has taught for 46 years. He's a beloved professor whose students voted him one of the 22 best English professors in America, among 300 best professors in a book published in 2012 by the Princeton Review in collaboration with RateMyProfessors.com, the popular online professor rating site. Professor Berman is also the author of many books, including Death Education in the Writing Classroom, based on an undergraduate writing course on love and loss that he taught at UAlbany in 2008. And he's had a remarkable, a watershed year in 2019 with four published books. And I'll include just two, Writing the Talking Cure, Erwin D. Yalom and the Literature of Psychotherapy, and Mad Muse, Mental Illness Memoir in a Writer's Life and Work. I could go on because there's very much more to say, but we'll join our conversation now. And uh, thank you, Jeff, for joining us. Thank you, Paul. It's an honor for me to be here with you. Um, this is a, an unprecedented time. Uh, I mentioned you've been teaching for close to 50 years, which is remarkable at, at the university. And uh, have you ever experienced anything like this? And, and how are you coping in this pandemic? Uh, no, no, this is completely unprecedented. I could not have, ima I could not have imagined this a few months ago. Um, I love teaching. I, I, tell, I told my students in January that this was my 48th year. And I like to think of myself as a mid-career with another 48 ahead of me. Um, but the joy that I feel in the classroom is gone as a result of having to teach by a distant learning. It's a very different kind of experience and one that I don't like at all. I'm hoping that in the fall we'll go back to face-to-face -face encounters in a real classroom. Um, but I love teaching. Uh, but, so the big change is that I'm teaching learning, but the rest of my life is still pretty much the same in that I spend most of my days reading and writing. Uh, and fortunately, I've been able to continue to do that. Uh, even though the library is closed, um, I get articles through interlibrary loan and uh, nearly every day I order an online book that I'm using for writing and so far that's um, been okay. Okay. Could I ask you to maybe move slightly to the right? I, th I think I'm- Am I right? Yeah, that's better. If you're, if you're right- Better? Here, yeah, the sound quality, I, I missed a little bit about that. So okay. basically you are keeping in touch with your students electronically and, right. and reading and writing, getting into right. library they, loan books. Exactly, my students send me their um, essays and I read them and comment on them. Um, but it's very different because at the university, students read their essays aloud to the entire class. Everybody has a copy of the essay, and we talk about um, what we like about the essay, what could be revised. That's missing by a distance learning. Right. Um, how about, uh, I've connected with some of, I work with freshmen uh, in the living learning communities, a world of writing, and I've kept in touch with them. I'm not teaching this semester, but some of them have issues with, you know, they don't have high speed internet at home right. or, or they're in a crowded apartment and several people need to use a computer. And are you facing issues of just access like that with your students? Yes. And in fact, um, even though I'm always emailing my students, there are still a few students uh, from whom I haven't heard. Um, and it could be that they don't have access to um, the internet. It could be that they're struggling for other reasons. Many of my students tell me that it's, a, it's hard for them to get out of bed in the morning because of the lack of structure. And many of them are uh, battling anxiety and depression. Um, if we were meeting in the classroom, they would be writing about 
their experiences, but to write about them online is a different experience. Right. So we're going to talk about that because that's a, a lot of your research has, has looked at depression and, and mental illness and, and writing and, and literary pursuit in particular. If I could also ask you to like move back a half a thing, you're, you're cutting off your, yeah, perfect. Okay. Um, hopefully the sound is good now. Now I can see your full face because I, okay. I was getting your, your chin dropped off. Right. Me. But anyway, um, from what I know, and, and, and again, I was in the English department as a graduate student in the early 1980s, and uh, so I've, I've known you that long, but th this interest seemed to really deepen and gel when you wrote the memoir of your own wife's death and your own grief. Was that the start of, of, of looking at grief and, and loss, or was it before that? Before that. Um, I'm 75 years old, and I've led such a deeply rewarding life, rewarded in so many ways. And yet, paradoxically, many of my books have the word death or dying or suicide in their title. Um, and there have been two traumatic experiences that have shaped my life. The second was the death of my first wife, Barbara, um, in 2004 at the age of 57 from pancreatic cancer. I never imagined that she would die because everybody in her family lived to their 90s and there was no history of cancer on either side of her family. The first tragedy occurred on Labor Day 1968 when my closest friend and mentor um, called me up to say he was in the process of committing suicide. I was a second year graduate student at Cornell. I was horrified by his suicide. I was taking a course at the time with uh, Walter Sladoff on Joseph Conrad and William Faulkner. And I remember Sladoff saying casually that there was some biographical evidence that Joseph Conrad had attempted suicide. Well, this was exactly at the time of Len's suicide. I wrote my PhD dissertation on Joseph Conrad and suicide. It was published as my first book, um, write, Joseph Conrad Writing His Rescue. And so many of my books um, represent ongoing efforts to understand the phenomenon of suicide. And um, in my writing classes, I give my students the opportunity to write about their own experiences with suicide. You would be surprised by how many students have been touched by suicide, either a relative or a friend's suicide or their own suicide attempt. So that every semester in my writing class, whether it's teaching love and loss or teaching expository writing, every semester, uh, at least one, and usually more than one student write, writes about suicide. And I give students the opportunity to write about their feelings. And writing is almost always therapeutic. It almost never is counter therapeutic. And um, even before the coronavirus um, struck us, um, suicide rates, particularly among college age students, have risen alarmingly. Um, there was a study that came out this past summer indicating, um, I think, a th about a 30% rise um, in the suicide rate among college age students. And so I'm not surprised when my students write about feeling depressed or feeling that they want to commit suicide. And I give them an opportunity to write about it. Um, they share their writings with students. And um, it's a powerful experience in the classroom. Yeah, I bet. So how many of my books are about this. Yeah, how, how do you get them to open up? Or are they willing to share these deepest, you know, darkest with, secrets with their classmates or with you? or? Yes, the, the reason they're willing to share these secrets with me is because they know that I will not be judgmental. They know that nobody will say anything inappropriate 
in the classroom. And um, over the years, I've developed a list of protocols to minimize the risk of a student writing about a traumatic experience and being re-traumatized in the process of writing. For example, students don't have to write on any topic that they find too um, alarming to write about. Um, if they write about depression or suicide or a topic or eating disorder or anything like that, um, they know that um, classroom comments will be limited to what are the favorite, what are our favorite sentences in this essay? Um, what, what sentences need to be revised because of a grammatical or stylistic error? The only way we touch comment is the following way. After we've spoken about the best sentences and others that need to be revised, the three students sitting to the right of the author will raise questions for the author to consider but the author can't respond, can't answer the question. For example, let's say you were writing about your grandfather's recent death. Right. So you would read your essay aloud. We would talk about why your essay is powerful, how sentences could be revised. And then the three people sitting to your right would raise questions. You can't answer them, but the question might be, were you close to your grandfather? And if so, in what way? Another student might raise the question, would you, be would you be willing to share your essay with your family? A third might say, was it hard for you to write this essay? Was it hard for you to read this essay aloud? So the, you, the author, would leave class that day thinking about these questions. You were, you were not put on the spot by forcing, being forced to respond to them. But if you wanted to revise and lengthen your essay, you might develop the questions that your classmates have asked. The point is that nobody has said anything to invalidate your feelings about your grandfather. Right. So it seems like, you know, I, I've seen those studies too, the, the record level of anxiety and depression in, in college students and young people and, and uh, you know, those who, who contemplate suicide or attempt suicide, you know, off the charts. How does that calculate into the, the interest in this class? Is it, is it something that students want to sign up for? Or are they hesitant to when they see the, the death in the title and the class? Is that a, a, a deal breaker for some students? <laughs> Actually, I think, um, my writing course on love and loss closes more quickly than any other course in the English department because of its reputation. Right. All you need, all you need to do is look online at Rate My Professor and you'll see people talking about appreciating the opportunity to write about experiences they've never shared even with relatives mm -hmm. or their best friends. Right. So um, students are eager to get into the course. And often I have to turn students away after the course closes at 25. The department chair has asked all of us not to let other people in. Um, and so I'm always getting emails from students saying, my grandmother just died. And I know taking your course and writing about her will be helpful. Please, can you let me in? Wow. And I always say, I'm sorry, but I can't. It's closed and I'm not permitted to let anybody else in. Yeah. But if that student is going to be at the university next year, he or she could take the course. Right. So it sounds like uh, the course is almost uh, as much about life lessons or coming to terms with loss as it is preparing someone, say, for an editorial job or to work in publishing or exactly. so it's more about the 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 level and depth of, of expression as much as the, the type and quality of prose? Or? Right. Um, students know that they can write about their feelings in a non-judgmental way, and that lifts a huge burden from their shoulders. And I've, I've been teaching for nearly half a century. I've never had a student tell me that he or she has regretted writing an essay right. um, on a dark topic. 
I could, if I wanted to, I could call the, co the course Writing About Love, Loss, and Recovery. I could call it Writing Outside of Your Comfort Zone. Right. I could call it Writing About Life Lessons. It would be the same course. Right. So talk about how, how this has led to your interest in, in this Mad Muse book where you actually look at you know, notable accomplished writers and, and how they e express their own suicidal tendencies or depression. I, I know you start with William Styron, right. Darkness Visible, which is a, a powerful book. I think did a lot of good to, to break that taboo and things, but how did you choose those writers and, and what did you learn from studying other writers that applies to your courses? Um, that's a great question. Um, for as long as I can remember, I've been interested in mental health and mental illness. Um, I wrote about Styron years and years and years ago uh, when he was still alive. Um, and I, I, like so many people, I was deeply moved by uh, Darkness Visible, which was published in 1990, and uh, in which he talks about being in his 60s and suddenly becoming depressed and suicidal. What's fascinating about Styron and about all the other writers in my book, Mad Muse, is that from their earliest writings, whether it's a novel or a short story or a scientific work or a law book, from their earliest writings, you can see their imaginative interest with mental illness. And if you keep reading their books as they get older and older, they write more autobiographically about their own struggle with mental illness. So just to return to Styron, after I read um, Darkness Visible, I went back to all of, all of his previous books and you could see in his first writings, Lie Down in Darkness, written well before Darkness Visible, that he describes the symptomatology of depression and suicide in exactly the same way that he describes it in Darkness Visible. Styron himself said that when he was in the hospital recovering from severe depression and suicidal thinking, he reread his old books and he was struck by the continuity in that all of them describe the same kind of symptomatology of depression and suicide. And he traces that back to um, childhood and his mother's um, death from cancer. And so you can see the continuity from book after book after book. And that continuity, their struggle with mental illness, but also the extent to which mental illness can be a catalyst for creativity, you see that from their earliest books to their latest books. So that's what prompted me to write Mad Muse. I was familiar with some of the authors, but not with all of the authors, and it became a great challenge. And what I usually do after I finish writing a book or after I finish writing a chapter on a writer, I'll send that chapter to the writer and I'll say, I've just written a book about you, or I've just written a chapter about your work. Would you be willing to read it and share with me your impressions? Um, Styron did that um, when I wrote about him in Surviving Literary Suicide. And uh, four of the authors uh, did that with Mad Muse. And it always helps me when an author I'm writing about will then share his or her impressions with me. Sometimes that author will correct a factual mistake that I make, but more often than not, the author will give me additional material right. that will strengthen a particular interpretation. Right. So this years of, of, of working in this, this almost a genre you, you've turned it into, does it improve your outlook? I think of you of a, as a happy, you know, upbeat, pleasant person. You're always in the darkness and, and the shadows, <laughs> but it seems to have the reverse effect that it's actually, you say it's therapeutic more than just like getting you down. You know, some people say they need a break from, from bad news and difficult subject, but you seem to keep going back to that well. 
Why is that? that? That's exactly right. I think there is a, a pleasure in trying to understand the subject and then writing about it. There is an aesthetic pleasure in trying to craft the best prose style you can. Um, there's the pleasure of temporarily um, avoiding your own issues of anxiety that might otherwise trouble you. I find that when I'm writing about depression, it helps me avoid becoming depressed. Wow. Uh, and I always have that sensation, which is why I return to these dark subjects. They're not, it, it's not morbid for me to write on these subjects. It gives me a feeling of control. It gives me a feeling of psychological understanding. It gives me a feeling of aesthetic pleasure. That's why I do it. If, if it, if it were something that was unpleasant, I would have stopped doing it years ago. Right. Is it, is it that sense that this is what I feel as a journalist? I mean, I interview a lot of people who are going through very difficult times and trauma, and it makes me put my own small complaints in perspective. Do you feel like you're writing about people that have it far worse than you in, in ways of that they have depression and things? Without a doubt. Moreover, writing about people like Styron or the other authors in my book, um, Kay Redfield Jamison, for example, one of the world's great experts on the relationship between creativity and mood disorders, right. or writing about Andrew Solomon, or writing about Ellen Sachs. It's inspiring and humbling. Um, their genius is so evident, and it inspires me to write about these people. I think their insights help me in my own life and um, whatever I can do to make their stories and books more accessible to others gives me great pleasure. I, I think there's always been a knife edge between creative genius and madness. You see it in visual artists and literary artists and musical geniuses. But I also see in writers, at least, uh, I don't know it at your level, but the writers I've, I've studied, uh, their biographies, a lot of addiction, alcohol and drugs. What do you think, is, is that a, a factor of trying to self-medicate the pain and depression? Or is it a factor of, you know, over uh, abusing any substance can lead to you know, mental health issues? I, I think it's both and, and, and more as well. Um, alcohol has been called the liquid muse. And this was how some of the greatest novelists of the 20th century self-medicated. Right. Faulkner and Hemingway and Fitzgerald, they were all wary of psychotherapy, fearing that it would diminish their own creativity, even though there's no evidence that that would have happened. But instead of taking advantage of the talking cure, they availed themselves of the writing cure. But sadly, in addition to that, they drank and drank and drank and drank. And that's what did um, both, both Fitzgerald and Hemingway in. And you know, I, this semester, every year, I teach a course in Fitzgerald and Hemingway. And if you look at their early novels, you see alcoholism, or at least drinking alcohol to excess. You see that in a positive, sympathetic way. These were novels they wrote in their 20s when they felt that they were invulnerable. But then if you trace their careers, in Fitzgerald's case, from this side of paradise to the great Gatsby to his last completed novel, Tender is in the Night, you see his vision darkening and you see how our alcohol contributes to the darkness of that vision. Right. Same thing with Hemingway. If you look at The Sun Also Rises, his first novel, almost all the characters drink to excess. Um, most are so-called good alcoholics. There's only one bad alcoholic. But then you read A Farewell to Arms, and you see the attitude toward alcohol darkening. And then you read For Whom the Bell Tolls, written in 1940, and you see some characters out of control because of their drinking. And so as these novelists age, 
they discover that their bodies simply cannot process all the alcohol they're drinking. This also happened to Styron, and he writes about his, his inability to drink without problems as one of the causes of his suicidal feelings. Right. I, I wonder, on balance, since they were self-medicating and, and, you know, some of them probably needed to get drunk to get through the day and just hold it together, but after time that diminishes their, their craft exactly. and their ability. But if they didn't have it, maybe they would not have written a single novel. Do you think it, it diminished these great artists who have, you know, a great life's work? Would it have even been better without alcohol? Or do you think it would have been compromised because then their depression would have flared out of control? Or Well, this is, of course, a speculative question. Right. It's impossible to know for sure. But there's no question that both Fitzgerald and Hemingway abused alcohol. and in the beginning, that may have been a way of avoiding depression or diminishing depression, but after a while, it became a symptom, another symptom of depression. Right. So um, the beauty of the talking cure, which is to say psychotherapy, is that it doesn't lead to those self-destructive um, side effects. Um, and I am a firm believer of the talking cure, and most of the writers in Mad Muse are as well. Right. So what are some of the success stories? Because we think of Hemingway's case, suicide, or, or others where, you know, abusing alcohol and, and drugs either shorten their life or diminish their output. What are some of the writers who have turned this, you know, addressing their depression, anxiety, mental illness in their favor and, and, and come out stronger and better on the other side? That's a great question. And I'll give you one example, Ellen Sachs. Mm -hmm. Ellen Sachs um, is the recipient of a MacArthur Genius Award. When she was in law school, she began breaking down, developing severe schizophrenia. Um, she was hospitalized, placed on medication, and over time, with the help of medication, but also with the help of constant psychoanalysis, she was able to regain control of her life. And her early books all focus on the intersection of law and psychiatry. She is, after all, a law professor at the USC. Right. It was only her fourth or fifth book um, titled The Center Cannot Hold, which you probably um, know is a line from Yeats's poem, right. The Second Coming. Right. Um, only with that memoir did she come out of the closet to reveal her lifelong struggle with schizophrenia. And it was a brave, courageous book to write because she feared um, the consequences of coming out and having her reputation as a law professor diminished. Right. Same thing with Kay Redfield Jameson. Right. She came out relatively late in life with her mental illness memoir, uh, An Unquiet Mind, in which she talks about having tried to kill herself with an overdose of lithium and fearing writing about this experience, fearing that she would lose her license to practice psychiatry. And so in, in the book, she talks about her meeting with the department chair at Johns Hopkins, and he put his arm around her and said, um, if we had to worry about all of our faculty members who were struggling with mental illness, we wouldn't have a department left. Yeah. Um, it was a brave and courageous book, and she's written many books after that. So these yeah. are examples of writers who, with the help of medication and with the help of psychotherapy, have been able to um, fulfill their many talents. Is there a parallel at all with, with kind of addressing and, and getting past this, this taboo of mental illness with LGBTQ people? There were you know, for the same instances where people would not have come out of the closet for fear of their profession or their family or others. Is it similar? Has it broken down mental illness around the same time or earlier than, than 
issues of sexuality and I think it's identical in that writers are struggling with stigma and they are struggling with depression um, and they don't know how to deal with these issues. Um, their inclination is not to talk about it with anybody, but when they make the decision to talk about it and to write about it and to go public, they feel a huge burden being lifted. Another example I write about is Andrew Solomon. Yes. One of the great writers of our age, um, his book on depression may be the best single book ever written on depression. Right. Well, I, I, I went back to his early novel, and in that early novel, you could see that he was struggling with mental illness and he was struggling with sexuality. Um, his, mo his dying mother never accepted the fact that he was gay, and this was a great shame on his part. After her death, he was so ashamed of being gay that he tried to commit suicide by, by developing HIV yeah. um, because he thought that that would be a way of committing suicide without, in effect, committing suicide. But instead of doing that, he wrote about his experiences. Right. And he's produced book after book that each book is, a, is extraordinary. Yeah, he's a, so he's these, a are inspire, these are inspiring authors who've had to overcome struggles with sexuality, struggles with depression, so struggles with mental illness. Um, and the impact on the reader is nothing less than inspiring. And they're telling the truth. They're not varnishing the truth. Right. Yeah. Andrew Solomon is a, a brilliant, brilliant writer. Um, and you think about the economics and the, the constriction of the publishing and book selling market. It's hard enough to be an author if, if you've got all your stuff together, let alone having to overcome all this and then have to go out and, and get a publisher and sell books and things. It's, it's yeah. extraordinary to see what they've overcome. Yeah. Let's talk about the, your friend in, in 1968, your classmate at Cornell. Was it also the, the time when, when it was not as open to discuss these things you think that ended up that, that he couldn't be saved or, or couldn't be uh, helped, that, that he was, yeah. it was too afraid yeah. to express it and to, to share it with others? Or? I, I think all of those reasons and others. Um, he was um, a lecturer at the University of Buffalo when I was an undergraduate. And during the four years that we were both there, he became increasingly depressed. His wife was seriously ill. He, th he thought he contributed to her illness. He thought he screwed up everybody um, th with whom he came into contact. And so after a while, he began call calling me up in the middle of the night with a blunt question, tell me why I shouldn't kill myself right now. Wow. That's a terrifying question for a student to hear from his teacher. I gave all kinds of reasons, um, but those reasons were not powerful enough for him to stay alive. And when I left Buffalo after I graduated, he had lost his job because he never finished his PhD dissertation, which was another source of shame. And so um, I was horrified, but not entirely shocked when he called me up to say he was in the process of killing himself. And uh, it's hard to describe the feeling of horror and devastation and guilt that I felt. One of the terrible ironies of suicide is that the closer you are to a person who attempts or commits suicide, the more guilt you feel toward that person's death. Of course. And this is different from any other kind of situation. For example, if, you're, if your mother dies of cancer, you don't feel like you caused the cancer. If your father died of diabetes, you didn't cause the diabetes. But, but if a parent or if a sibling or if a spouse or if a child commits suicide, you feel so guilty as well as angry. And 
it took me a long time before I was able to talk about lens suicide. And once I started talking, I literally couldn't stop. Right. And so every semester in my writing classroom, every semester in my Fitzgerald Hemingway course, I talk to my students about why I'm teaching these writers. And I talk about my own experience and how that experience has shaped my life. It's interesting that he called you as a student, and was he also expressing this to the people closer to him as his wife, or were they estranged or other they family were, members? Or? His, his, what, he was estranged from his wife. He had little contact with his parents. He was, we were best friends, and um, that's why he called me, and that contributed to my feelings of guilt. I felt more guilt than anger. Yeah. Um, so it, yeah. it was in his class, it was in his freshman English class that I met the woman whom I later married. And Barbara was as devastated as I was. And I write about this in, in, in my books. And there's another terrible irony to this story um, during my second year at Cornell, after Len had died, Barbara had come with me to the library, which she seldom did. And she was reading the New York Times one day, and she came across Len's wife's obituary. Uh. She died on the day of his birthday, and both Barbara and I felt that it was what's called an anniversary reaction. That is to say, committing suicide on the day that, uh, on, the, on the birthday of somebody who also committed suicide. Right. So the yeah. story was just so dark um, and it stayed with me all of these years. And I feel, I, I've always identified with the Coleridge's ancient mariner who um, plucks out a wedding guest uh, at random and begins to confess to that uh, right. wedding guest. And so there's this, a part of my teaching which has a confessional uh, impulse. And I encourage my students with their own self-disclosures. And um, I'm one of the most self-disclosing professors you'll ever find. But all of the research on self-disclosure indicates that self-disclosure begets self-disclosure. So if I reveal something personal to you, it's like I'm giving you a gift and you reciprocate by telling me something personal about your life. Right. Um, that's how self-disclosure works. Right. It sounds like, and his name was Len, your friend. Your, yes. So it sounds like you're honoring his memory beautifully and you're, you're, you're paying it forward by bringing, you know, his story and having this opportunity for students. But I, I want to ask, teaching 50 years, is it getting better? I mean, you've read so many personal, probably heart-wrenching stories from students. Does it feel like we're either better with treatment, we're better at diagnosing, we're more supportive of, of these issues. I, I know there's resources on campus. I know we have Middle Earth Counseling Center. I know, uh, you know we have, have pretty good support for students, but you feel it's getting better in your 46 years teaching at UAlbany? Um, yes and no. Um, yes, in the sense that we have a greater understanding of the origins and treatment of depression and suicide. Yes, there is less stigma than in the past. But on the other hand, um, the depression statistics and the suicide statistics are at an alarming high, even before the virus. Right. So one likes to think that we're making steady progress, but that's not always true. And I think, um, these are such fraught times our students are struggling now right i um i still write for the times union i did a long sort story a series of stories on the heroin and opioid addiction i don't know six or seven years ago before it really 
broke into the published consciousness because I write, read the obituaries every day. And it's very telling. I started seeing young people dying with no cause of death. And I started calling some of those families. And again, that was a taboo. Nobody would talk about this, this new drug scourge of heroin and now fentanyl. And eventually people started talking and, and a lot of people, it opened the floodgates. Like you're saying, if, if one family there was one woman that first told her story of her daughter's uh, overdose after many tries at treatment. And then other families would come forward to talk to me. But I've been noticing, and I, I think I'm going to pursue this in the last week or so, young people dying without a cause of death. And I'm exactly wondering if it's suicide because of the, the stress, the anxiety, the angst with COVID-19. Are you, are you reading anything like that yet in the literature? or? or? Um. I agree with your perception, and I think that um, the reason so many people are dying of, um, of opioids is because of undiagnosed and untreated depression. Right. Um, and the situation will certainly be worse before it begins to get better in terms of the virus, but now you have to add um, crushing economic fears that didn't exist a month ago. So one struggles to the best of one's ability and simply giving students the opportunity to write about their feelings is a way of helping them. You use the metaphor of opening the floodgates. That's a good metaphor. Another metaphor would be to um, relieve a burden that's been crushing them because when they come to the first class, they look around and they see students who seem to be without a problem. And then that only makes each person feel more isolated. But over the weeks of a writing class, somebody will write an essay about having been sexually abused, or an essay about struggling with anorexia or bulimia, or an essay about struggling with alcohol. And that will open the floodgates and that will give other students the opportunity to write about their own experiences. And by the end of the semester, they're astonished by how close they feel to their classmates. They know more about their classmates in my writing class than in any other class they've ever taken. And there's a certain beautiful anonymity in opening up to a group of strangers. Right. I think the work you're doing is, is so important, not just to help them with their writing craft, but also to help them to express things maybe they've held in for so long, have been holding them back. It seems like you're also part counselor, therapist, social worker, but you, you build such a bond with your students and it's obviously, you know, they vote you one of the, the great teachers in America. Do you, do you hear from, your uh, alumni, you know, going forward, have you heard from somebody you had in a class 30 years ago and say, hey, I turned my life around, I, I really struggled for a long time? Do you, do I do. you hear some of those positive stories? And yes. Um, as a result of email, almost every week, certainly every month, I receive one or more emails from students who have taken my course courses 10, 20, 30 years ago. And they're always success stories. They're about people who have um, become social workers or professors or psychologists or who have opened up their own businesses. And um, they're always talking about the impact of, a, of one of my courses on their lives. And um, that's deeply gratifying. Um, I teach them a lot, but they teach me a lot. I, I've learned so much from my students. I learn as much from them as I hope they have learned from me. And that's why the idea of retirement is such an anathema to me. I just, you know, my fantasy, actually I ended one of my books this way. Um, I ended with my uh, idealized death in the classroom at the end of a very good semester. And then somebody persuade a colleague persuaded me, no, Jeff, you don't want to die in front of your students. That would be way too traumatic. And I agree. So the way I ended my book was, um, it was the end of a semester and I walked to my office, I had turned in my grades, I put my feet on my desk and I expired. Wow. That, that for me is a heroic death, as heroic as any deaths you see in Hemingway. Yeah, I mean, 
<laughs> I, I know some of your colleagues and some of my uh, uh, Albany emeritus professors went into their 80s, mid 80s, late 80s. So you said you're 75. You have no plans of, of stopping anytime soon. No, I think I'm, um, I, how do I say this immodestly? I think I'm a better teacher now than I was 40 years ago. I think I'm a better writer than I was 40 years ago. I'm in excellent health except for bad hearing. And um, I'll share with you one, one story before we leave. Okay. Um, you, you must have known Warren Roberts. Of course. Warren was an inspiring history professor, one of the most yes. beloved professors on campus and a, a terrific scholar. And I remember several years ago seeing him, we were both in the bathroom and he, he had just turned 80. And he said to me, you know, Jeff, I'm gonna to have to retire now because I can't hear my students anymore. And that was why he retired. I myself have hearing problems. It's hard for me to hear my female students even with my hearing aids. So I was telling a colleague in another department about Warren's story. And I said to my colleague, you know, sadly, I seem to be following in my colleague's footsteps. If and when I retire, it will be because I can't hear my students anymore. And the, my colleague said to me, if I didn't have to hear my students, I'd want to teach forever. <laughs> Not the answer I was. I, no. I imagine. <laughs> with technology, no matter what your hearing issue is, I'm sure they'll be coming up <laughs> with better hearing aids. So I, I hope you go for another 30 years and another 20 books. This has been a <laughs> delight. I, I came you. to University of Albany in 1981, and I know I, I encountered you in the English hallways. I never took a class from you, but I always admired. You always had students in your office. Students were talking about that Berman, but I was only there for a graduate student, and, and I don't know, and only for the master's degree. So I don't know if you were teaching ma uh, graduate courses at that time. But anyway, I always like seeing you at the university. Thank you for participating in our Albany Book Festival, and uh, we'll have you back. We're going to do the book festival in September. Hope you'll be back again. Thank you. It's been a great joy for me. A uh, professor I greatly admire. He's a distinguished teaching professor of English, Dr. Jeffrey Bourbon. We call him Jeff. Thank you very much for joining the conversation. My pleasure. Thank you so much, Paul. All right. Thank you.